Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast and I am Marcus. Every now and then, when you no longer believe it, the most wondrous things can happen. Like this episode, for example. We almost didn't make it this time. My guest couldn't come to the scheduled date. We rescheduled, and I couldn't, and so we went back and forth. Since neither of us knew each other, we sensed the nearing abyss of mutual ignorance. And we were almost ready to pull the plug, hold our heads high, and get on with our daily lives, you know, just the way things are done these days. But luckily, we got our act together. Hi, Marcus. Well, I'm happy I'm talking to someone from Vienna. That's always a pleasure. From today's perspective, anything else would have been a disaster. Thank you so much, Susmita Mohanty, for that mutual moment and your wisdom. The narrative that most of us are fed since school days is a very Hollywood and NASA-driven narrative. Susmita Mohanty is an Indian spaceship designer, serial space entrepreneur, and a climate action advocate. She's the only space entrepreneur in the world to have started companies on three different continents in Asia, Europe, and North America. Susmita was nominated to the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council for Space Technologies, and she was included in the BBC's list of 100 inspiring and influential women from around the world. Susmita offers the Western world, and in our case, the Western-dominated space world, a refreshing redefinition. Welcome, Susmita Mohanty. You know, today we are reading about Musk's booster, F Falcon 9 booster, will crash into the moon on 4th of March, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It's a four-ton chunk of metal with an engine at the back end. And if it were China or, say, Russia crashing a a booster into the moon, there would be this hue and cry. And we are talking about this as if it's just another day in paradise. Let's also talk about... It's a a future piece of trash which will never go away. Never, never. And also, I think, uh, you know, I'm part of the World Economic Forum and other fora as well. There is a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback from wealthy nations, wealthy companies, for there to be no penalties whatsoever if we were to treat near-Earth space as a landfill or Mm -hmm. the moon as a landfill for that matter. Um, So, Smita, I have a a very blunt question. Uh, I find it very fascinating because we were talking about narratives and reshaping narratives. You had the great privilege to meet Arthur C. Clarke, is that right? Oh, yeah, not just the privilege of meeting him. He um, pretty much gave me a blank check when I was looking for funding to go to the Space University in 96. How was that? I mean, like, how was he as a person? Oh, he was faster to respond to messages than most people I know. And remember, he had post-polio syndrome, so he was permanently Mm -hmm. wheelchaired. And Mm -hmm. he could stand up holding a table while, if he wanted to play ping pong, say... He loved scuba diving, which is Colombo was perfect mm-hmm. from that. But we, we became friends. So I initially reached out to nice. him when I reached out to seven different individuals around the world, including Bill mm-hmm. Gates and Carl Sagan uh, and a mm-hmm. few others. Wow. Those were pre-internet days. So I wrote to them personal letters and sent them a synopsis of my work, including a big fat project document where I had argued that a space saucer makes more sense than a patchwork of Gokan-shaped modules. It was interesting. There were two people who responded. One was a well-known Indian photographer who has an amazing studio in Manhattan. He said, Mm -hmm. I can't pay your tuition, but I can give you a job in New York. And Arthur Clarke uh, called me on a weekend in the afternoon himself. Uh, I was was napping. You know, we nap in India. We have our (laughs) siesta on weekends. Sure. Sure. So I woke up and I I couldn't believe that it was Arthur Clark on the other end of the phone. And he said, Mrs. Smitha, I got your letter and enclosures. And how much money do you need? <laughs> I was, I just blurted out a number and uh, wow. 
the rest wow. is history. Did you, did you ask Arthur C. Clarke the question of all questions, the final scene of Stanley Kubrick's <laughs> depiction or rendering of his beautiful novel, What is this damn scene all about? Yep, you know, that's the a strange room decorated as a hotel. Very psychedelic, isn't it? No, I, I, I did happen to ask him that particular question. I just always assumed <laughs> that Kubrick was high on something. And he just came right. up with the most weird, magical scenery at the end. Ex no, I didn't. No. But I think one of the things Arthur said just a year before he passed away, he died in 2009. Mm -hmm. I wrote to him in 2007 saying that I'm planning to move back to India. I'm leaving San Francisco. And uh, he wrote back saying, that's very strategic, Susmita. I said, why do you say that? And uh, quoting Arthur, he said, everything began in the East and it's going back there. And then he gave the example. <laughs> he gave the example of Chinese alchemists having invented gunpowder. And no gunpowder, no rockets. So that was Arthur Clark for you. So the room, the strange Renaissance-style room, if you will, brings me to your Renaissance-type way of life. You sometimes describe to be indulging in. What, what do you mean? What, what is it? What does Renaissance lifestyle mean in your life? Yeah, so I, Marcus, I seamlessly straddle the worlds of architecture, design, technology, and being an entrepreneur in, in, in the last 20 years, a business. I was raised in the 70s in a city called Ahmedabad. And I was growing, I grew up in the milieu of scientists who Vikram Sarabhai, the founder of India Space Program, had recruited as his dream team. So the early pioneers of the Indian Space Program. And the city I grew up in also happened to be home to very many textile mill owner families, wealthy industrial families, who would invite amazing architects, contemporary architects from India, from abroad, to design private residences and public buildings. So we had Corbusier, the Swiss-French architect. We had Louis Kahn, the hmm. American architect. We had some of the fantastic Indian architects of the time. Bibi Doshi, who got the Pritzker a couple of years ago. Charles Correa. So I'm saying, what I'm trying to say here is the cultural milieu and the scientific milieu that I was raised in was a natural influencer, you know, in my formative years. So I never drew the line between uh, the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain. Unfortunately, if you look at contemporary education, the way it is rendered in most schools, They kind of always put you into silos, like you are a STEM student versus an art student. Right. And that's the kind right. of division that was never part of my growing up years, which is why today, if you ask me, I'm very easy. Uh, I, I actually love inhabiting that crossover space. I can give you an example. I did an underwater dance experiment in Delhi in 2015, where I invited a French choreographer, Kitsu Dubois, To visit India, Kitsu is one of those choreographers who has worked extensively with underwater dance performances, with circus acrobats like the Cirque du Soleil. And she's also been on very many parabolic flights where she researched what happens to the human body, our notions of the vertical and, uh, you know, what happens to the central nervous system in variable gravity, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I invited her and... I collaborated with a contemporary dance company in Delhi, where we brought in young dancers and choreographers to work with Kitsu in this underwater movement workshop. And I personally think that was a fantastic experience because you always try to think of astronaut trainers as people who teach astronauts how to go from point A to point B inside a module. They do that in the neutral buoyancy tank, or on parabolic flights. But here was Kitsu, who was taking both an artistic approach uh, as well as a scientific approach to movement in, in variable gravity. So, for example, tomorrow when we set up a human outpost on the moon, which has one-sixth gravity, I think we should invite the likes of Kitsu to advise us on speculating how will movement happen in a one-sixth environment. Hmm. Fascinating. 
Right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of thinking which doesn't stop at science and technology. Let's include the arts. Yeah. Is this also being done already for future projects that artists are being invited into the debate? Or is this still a strange thing to do? Uh, the artists have always wanted to be part of the uh, discourse. I remember in my early years in 1998, when I started working for the International Space Station program with Boeing in Southern California, uh, I remember artists approaching NASA, artists talking to the European Space Agency, and also Japanese artists talking to JAXA, uh, wanting to be included in the International Space Station program, as in through an artistic intervention, right? I remember a Brazilian artist even proposed uh, designed and proposed a module, an entire art module for the space station. Did it happen? No, it didn't. Uh, have some of the artists flown some of their works mm. in outer space, in the space station, for example, on Mir, on the International Space Station? Yes, they have. But I think the engagement of the artistic community needs to be a lot more holistic, not this one of, let me fly a little thing in outer space kind of engagement. I think it needs, they need to be integrated mm -hmm. into, the, into all of our programs sure. for exploration. So not just in low Earth sure. orbit, but beyond. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a, a very condensed ride through your life as quickly as possible? Uh, so I started working on perceived problems of living and working in microgravity was, while I was still in high school. And for every 10 letters and ideas that I would send out to universities or space agencies around the world, I would hear back from at least two or three of them. So that was the initial years of my, uh, you know, amateur design experiments. My professional journey began in 1998 with a brief stint at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, where I worked on shuttle main missions. I then went on to work for Boeing in Huntington Beach, Southern California, on the International Space Station program. Uh, my background is a mix of four different degrees. So a bachelor's in engineering, a master's in industrial design, another master's in space studies, not so much for another master's degree, but to become part of the international community of space people. And then I did a PhD in an invented discipline called aerospace architecture from Sweden. Uh, so after Boeing, I decided that maybe it's time for me to start my own little company. So I moved to San Francisco and started a company called Moonfront. You know, back in the day, the word startup didn't quite exist. And nobody was really going around starting companies in space, IT companies you had heard of, but not space companies. So this was a first a first generation entrepreneur kind of experience so the company was a boutique consulting firm a couple of years later i co-founded a company with an architect friend in vienna called liquifer liquifer celebrated its 15th anniversary a couple of years it's one of the few companies in the world where engineers and industrial designers and architects work in a multidisciplinary fashion to design space habitats rovers spacesuits that kind of thing I moved back to India in 2008 and started my third venture called Earth to Orbit. The first seven years, we focused on facilitating international satellite launches on the Indian TSLV rocket. We played a major role in opening up the U.S. launch market for India, which was closed because of an embargo and some outdated export controlled laws. Uh, we then went on to also design models where we would use open source satellite imagery from the European Sentinel constellation uh, with machine learning analytics for applications on Earth. We mostly focused on agriculture and climate smart cities. So that was my last venture. And this past year, I think COVID was a time of catharsis in some ways. And I decided it was time to reset, recalibrate and I decided to move on from mainstream entrepreneurship, and I launched a space think tank, uh, a space think tank called Spaceport hmm. Sarabai. So that's pretty much the entire trajectory. You're, you're living multiple lives already. Um, in your biography, Susmita, you describe yourself as a spaceship designer. So 
Why is there no Star Trek type Enterprise yet? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I deliberately use the term spaceship designer because often when you tell people you are a space architect, they always think that you are good enough only to design the interiors of a space uh, habitat. So I think the words spaceship designer invariably provokes a conversation where I then get a chance to clarify that to be heard. To be mm -hmm. heard that it's not just the aesthetic mm -hmm. aspects of the interior of a station. It's a lot more. It's systems engineering, it's human factors, it's ergonomics. So that gives me a chance to stretch their imagination a bit and understand that there are things which embrace both the functional aspects of space habitats, rovers, what have you, and also the human factors or habitability aspects. So that's the reason I use the term quite freely, actually. Sure. But um, going back to Star Trek, how, how far do you think are we from building major spaceships? I'm not talking about the, the propulsion systems that will possibly reside in the science fiction realm forever. But I mean, seriously, like bigger spaceships, how far are we from doing something like this? Because I, I feel like we're at the moment, we're focusing on leaving the planet to either go to a space station or to the moon or ultimately to Mars. But Where is a major spaceship uh, yes. cruising through space in all of this? You, you're talking about intergenerational spaceships. That's what yes. I, I grew up on a healthy staple, like a Sunday staple of Star Trek Enterprise. When television was new in India, every Sunday, we used to get to watch Star Trek and Cosmos by Carl Sagan. We are very, I remember that. You do, right? Yeah. yeah. We, yeah, we are, I'm a big fan. We are, we are light years away, light years away from yes. that kind of intergenerational spaceships. I think the reason, Marcus, is we humans, as in the Homo sapiens, I feel are a rather primitive species. We spend way too much time in self-destruction. You know, look at what's happening to climate. Look at the amount of money that we have wasted in wars, never-ending wars. Uh, had we spent that Uh, money in researching <laughs> and developing next generation propulsion systems, for example, we would be at least 100, 200 years further on. But unfortunately, that's not happened. I mean, DARPA in the United States is doing some phenomenal research. But really, we are ourselves responsible for, for lagging behind in so many ways when it comes to especially advanced propulsion, advanced modes of transportation. Uh, we're still flying chemical rockets. How primitive is that? Absolutely. Mm. How primitive is that? So I think this needs a little bit of um, a cross-cultural dialogue, I guess, because, I mean, like, the entire space industry has been driven by the United States, by Russia, over the past decades. Now it seems like it's opening up, but it's still Hollywood And it's still United States. So you being from India, you have traveled the world. Now you're back in India. What can we learn from India as a culture different to the Western culture? Um, when it comes to making that dream you were talking about, that evolutionary leap for mankind, a reality? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. What can we learn from India? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Clearly, my... I was born and raised in the Eastern Hemisphere, where, I mean, India is one of the oldest civilizations on this planet, thousands of years old. This is where mathematics and astronomy and whatnot began. So I think in the East, if you ask me, we don't look at space, at least I, being an Easterner, I don't look at space, culturally speaking, as a frontier. Uh, I think the frontier mentality comes from the colonial narrative. To me, there is no need for us to conquer space. I look at space as a natural extension of my cosmic presence here on Earth, right? So I think culturally, we need to move away from this vocabulary of conquest, which would be a great way to also then embracing a planetary ethic, you know, whereby we treat everything, including near-Earth space, as a finite resource, shared by humanity, and not uh, clutter it, not destroy it environmentally as we are currently 
doing, right? So I think culturally, that's the big difference. And if you ask me, we also need to recenter the narrative. What I mean by recentering the narrative is for the longest time, everything happened in Hollywood films or everything that good that happened was done by NASA. Very few people out there know, for example, that China is the only country to have successfully landed on the moon three consecutive times in the last decade. And not just that, they even brought back lunar samples after 44 years. So the last American landing on the moon happened in 72, and the last Russian landing happened in 76. So I think the narrative, as is propagated through the PR agencies of space, government space agencies, or through the private media channels, needs to make that shift to not... Uh, I, I would love to quote the African writer, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, whose book I recently read, it's called Half of a Yellow Sun. She said beautifully, the danger of a single narrative or the danger of a single story is that you start stereotyping countries, right? If I'm watching a Hollywood film, I can stereotype the Russians as a couple of floating chess pieces, I can stereotype the Chinese as a couple of floating chopsticks instead of showing how advanced their space programs are. So I think we need to recenter the narrative where the focus also needs to be on Europe and on Asia, mm -hmm. not just on NASA, not just North America. Mm. So then we get the real picture. So how, are we going in, the, in that direction? <laughs> not at all. Unfortunately, no. I This morning I read in BBC News that one of SpaceX's, let's call it a stray rocket booster, a Falcon 9 rocket booster, which has been up in space since 2015, will be made to collide or crash into the moon on 4th of March, <laughs> right? It's a four-ton <laughs> chunk of metal with an inch in at the end of it. And the <laughs> way the news article was written was, it's no big deal, it's just another little collation on the moon. But had <laughs> some other countries, say India or China or Russia, done the same thing, it would have made a big splash and sensationalization as creating a lot of debris on the moon. So I, I think that's what I mean by recentering the narrative where, let's say, debris creation should be a bad thing no matter which country is doing it i mean like seriously um we're talking here on earth we're talking about debris issues and waste issues we have waste in our oceans wherever we go and now we're starting to do the same off earth on the moon and no one is watching no one is looking like i have the story you just mentioned right in front of me this is austrian news and we're in fact so no one is saying it but between the lines we're celebrating that thing that Elon Musk rocket crash will crash into the moon as something cool. Yeah, as if it's um, a Hollywood film, something exciting. Yeah. No, I, I think the, also the problem is, as if you ask me, I'm a child of the 70s and the 80s. And for us, critical thinking was a sport. To be able to critically sure, think and sure. question was normal. And now I see that sure. if you look at Silicon Valley, I lived in San Francisco for nine years. I can see that there is a rise of what I call anti-intellectualism and they have embraced unicornism. It's all about being wealthy and super fast, right? Mm. It's all about going IPO and making lots of money. So I think the intellectual component sure. in exploration needs to be amplified. We need to ask the right questions, the tough questions. There will be pushback from wealthy companies and wealthy countries, but I think... Space debris is now out of hand. We have 330 million plus absolutely man-made objects orbiting uh, in near-Earth space. And each of those debris objects is moving at enormous speeds, 28,000 kilometers an hour. So it packs a punch. And these are, I would say, ticking time bombs. And it is. there are no enforceable laws yet to make sure that we clean up the debris that's already up there and mitigate future debris. So it's a very is, difficult is, situation right now. 
Where is space policy these days? Of course, we know that the nations and countries are negotiating, but is it negotiating for negotiating's sake? Or is it because we really want to fix this? Well, let's let's put it this way. I mean, you were sitting in Vienna, which is one of my favorite cities in Europe, where we have the United Nations mm -hmm. Office for Outer Space Affairs. Then there is also the UN Corpus. Yes. So ideally, given how dangerous the situation is in low Earth orbit, the, the conference of parties or the committee of nations should already be seriously sitting around a table trying to figure out what the laws ought to be. But there is so much pushback. I can tell you that instead of multilateralism, we are we see, we're seeing unilateralism. I can give you examples. In 2015, during the Obama regime, the U.S. Congress passed a law which says that if an American company goes and brings back resources from any celestial object, they can own it and keep it. Similarly, in Luxembourg, the parliament passed a similar asteroid mining law. So here are countries that are already legislating about off-Earth mining, right? So they can bring back the celestial uh, loot and keep it. So I think But it's their national law. It's a national law. And the problem is that if countries start passing these kind of legislations, then the Outer Space Treaty, which was signed in 1967, which clearly states that space is a cosmic commons, is dead on arrival. And hmm. I think that treaty was designed for the times they were in. It was for the 60s to prevent nuclearization of space, weaponization yeah. of space. But now we need an overhaul. We need to overhaul the 1967 Outer Space Treaty in the context of what's happening now. And I think that's a tall order to bring all the nations together and agree mm -hmm. on far-sighted, enforceable laws. It's something that needs to be undertaken sooner than later. I mean, like the interesting thing about policymaking and lawmaking is that takes a very long time. And the evolution of technology is happening at a very different pace. And so this is a predicament where we have maneuvered ourselves into. So maybe we will never be able to reach that moment where we can fix everything um, because technology has already produced debris or mayhem or whatnot in the first place. I, I think from a technology perspective, Marcus, we already have the technology we need to start deorbiting dead satellites. We already have the technology. It's only a handful of companies, but they're already building that technology. So we are not, we are now in a very sweet spot, if you ask me. We have the technology to deorbit dead satellites and also bring in laws where you make it mandatory for companies like Starlink, OneWeb, Planet, all these mega constellation companies that they should deorbit their satellites towards the end of their lifetime. They're all flying in low Earth orbit. So their lifetimes are very short, two years. They two must. I wouldn't say they should. They must deorbit. They must. So it's mandatory. Mandatory, yes. Right. And currently the laws make it, I mean, they're required to deorbit a dead satellite in 25 years. Like they have up to 25 years to deorbit. How ridiculous mm -hmm. is that? They should ideally be deorbiting dead satellites within a month to three months of them having died. Or even better, they should be deorbiting the satellites towards the end of the lifetime of the satellite. Like when they know the fuel is running out and it's going to die, deorbit it. So we need laws. And I think an intergovernmental agency needs to come together to write these laws and enforce these laws. Let's talk a, l a little bit about the narrative you were touching upon a couple of minutes ago, the global narrative being very centered on Hollywood and, and the United States, because beyond the narrative, things are different. And could you uh, talk a little bit about the fact that global space travel and space endeavors are not US-centered at all anymore, because many technologies subscribe under US projects, but are produced in other places of this world. So could you talk about uh, yeah, yeah, I would love to give you a couple of examples, Marcus. Uh, for example, you might have heard about uh, this company called Axiom in Texas, which is 
going to build one of the first commercial space stations in low Earth orbit. So the pressurized module, the first pressurized module for Axiom, guess who is building it? It's being built hmm. by Thales Alenia Space in Torino, in Italy. I can give wow. you another mm -hmm. example. So there is the Artemis program that NASA has announced, and NASA and its allies have signed what is called the Artemis Accords. They are planning an orbiting space station around the moon. It's the Gateway Project. And the Gateway Project, hmm. two of the... Mm -hmm. critical hardware. So one is the HALO module, which is the Habitation and Logistics Orbiting Outpost. It's called HALO. That is being designed and built mm -hmm. again in Italy, in Torino, by Thales Alenia Space. And Thales Alenia is also doing a study for the European Space Agency to design and build what is called the CLTD or in other words, the logistics transporter, the one, the module that will carry supplies to this orbiting lunar station. So I think things like this, I mean, these are of interest to me because I'm interested in space architecture and design. But again, from a narrative point of view, most young people or people interested in space in Europe, they're not aware of this. And neither are the Americans aware of the fact that Absolutely. these modules are being built in Europe state-of-the-art pressurized modules. So I, I think, again, it's all a question of storytelling and we need to tell the story right. I really like the discussion we're having because this is all, all about breaking up crusted structures and those structures produce and construct belief. And that's the problem I believe we all have because if I'm speaking from the perspective as a European, if we Europeans do not understand the role we really have in space. We will never support any kind of political endeavors we may have in the future. So I think it's super critical to be aware of the fact that there are narratives on this planet and those narratives have a reason. And this is all about having the right funds and having the political power and the, the whole shebang of storytelling. I, I, I love what I, I love works. what you yeah. yeah, I love what you're saying, Marcus, because I think public support and political will, they ride on the correct narratives. So if the European citizens and the decision makers in Brussels and elsewhere knew what's actually happening they would probably be looking at European leadership in space matters differently. For hmm. example, it is disappointing that Europe does not have its own human space ferry. You know, I, I remember the French wanted to build it. I remember the Italians wanted to build it. But because ESA operates with consensus, it never happened. And yet here we are, Torino building all of the future habitable modules for America. So I think Europe needs to collaborate with NASA, but should not piggyback on NASA to the extent sure. that it loses a strategic leadership position in exploration or utilization. If Yusuf Smith had a, a say in the global field, what role should Europe have in the new space world? I think Europe has all the technological pieces in place. It is very, it's in a global context. Technologically, Europe is very well placed to lead, especially in things like space transportation, which it is not currently. I mean, there's the Ariane rocket, but then again, Elon Musk with his reusable boosters is giving Ariane a run for the money. So I think Europe needs to refocus and re strategize its transportation roadmap for the coming decade mm -hmm. so that they can independently explore near-Earth space, our solar system. And of course, Europe being Europe will collaborate with other countries, but they should lead and, sure. and not follow all the time. And I think there's a big difference there, and I want Europe to do that. I also should add that Europe's environmental conscience is, in my view, several notches above the United States when it comes hmm. to environmental ethics or laws. So I think Europe should also take a lead in space environmentalism. That's the other place you know, I want Europe to lead. You know what, Susmita, this is so fascinating to hear. And sometimes you need to hear things from a different place, from a different person about yourself to really appreciate 
the situation you're in? Because we Europeans, or me, myself and uh, as an Austrian, I'm still criticizing our green strategies because I think they do not go far enough yet. But now you telling me from a different perspective that this is already way beyond what America uh, is doing. Yes, that's indeed. that's very interesting. Indeed, to see. you know, I lived in San Francisco for nine years, and the average per capita trash that the San Franciscans were generating back then was 17 kilos a day, which is hmm. humongous. And not only that, the United no. States exports its landfills to other countries, which the EU doesn't allow. It's forbidden. So I think the whole approach to trash management or the environment, I find Europe is clearly ahead in that, mm -hmm. in, in the game. And they should take a leadership position in space environmentalism. I think everything boils down to proper education. Proper education is needed for space awareness, proper education is needed for sustainability, for planetary awareness. So my question to you, and I'm super happy I have the opportunity to talk with you, because you have such a, a broad perspective across many cultures, because you have immersed yourself in many different cultures. So the question is, the Western educational system is in crisis. How is that for the Indian ed uh, educational system? And is there maybe also something we can learn from each other? I, I think if I look at the Indian education system, I would say what you just said about the European education system from your point of view. I think the Indian education system also needs an overhaul. Uh, a complete overhaul, because the way we design our curriculum, the way we train young minds to think about the present mm -hmm. and the future uh, is very siloed. We divide everything into mathematics and science and the arts. Mm. What we are mm. lacking in India and elsewhere, I think, is something where we teach young people critical thinking to be able to ask the difficult questions And not just always focus on grooming themselves to end up finding the right job with a big tech company. I mean, the average Indian, if you ask me today, the dream the parents have, the students have is about finding that big job with a Google or a Facebook or a Twitter or one of the big tech companies. And that to me is myopia at its finest. That's not what your life's ambition should be. Your life's ambition should be, how do I solve problems around me, you know, at a local level, at a city level, at a global level, at a planetary level. So I think that Finland, I must give the example here of Finland, which I've been fascinated by as a country. I got my PhD from Sweden, so I had a chance to explore the Nordic mm -hmm. countries. I think Finland has a mm -hmm. fascinating education system where students play half day. They play, actually. They play half day and study half the day. And they don't have subjects in many of the schools. I, I hear. I have to actually visit a school to see how it works. But no subjects as such. It's all project-oriented learning or problem-solving. I, I, I think we need to move towards a similar format where we dissolve the lines between biology and chemistry and mathematics and physics and visual arts and uh, performing arts and bring it together to solve problems. That should be the future, not the siloed education that we are all given across the world. We're gradually moving towards the end of our beautiful conversation. Usually at the end, I'm asking my guest one of the same question, but we've never gotten the same answers. And the question is, this is a space uh, cafe podcast. This is a coffee house, a coffee place. Why don't you give us your space espresso And that is whatever comes to your mind that could be of inspiration for our audience. And you're absolutely free to share whatever you want to share with us, with the audience, with me, that could be inspiring for our years. Okay, I think for the Space Espresso, I would want a very strong brew for the listeners where it could be bitter, but bitter is bitter is good. And I love espresso. No sugar. No sugar, yes. Uh, all black. So I think, I think the, the bitter truth, let us all unite 
and face the bitter truths that are staring us in the face, whether it is the sort of destruction of near Earth space, whether it is the climate collapse that we are seeing and experiencing every mm. day all around us. Let us therefore take that difficult step of bringing about changes in human behavior, which would mean our own behavior and the behavior of people around us to make things a little more environment friendly, a little less consumer centric, because I think consumerism is really, is gone through the roof. So we can own a little less, we can have lesser things around us. And let's all not just plant, but nurture trees into adulthood. You know, I always say that it's always nice for your selfies to go and plant something, but it mm. takes a good 10, 20 years to actually nurture them into adulthood. In fact, mm. I do grow trees myself and I name them. So when I visit the cities I used to live in where the trees are grown now, they have names and I go and meet them. So I think those two things, let's change the way we live. And only then our planet will stand a chance. Hmm. Susmita, how can we follow your tribe? <laughs> I think all over the metaverse, I would love for people to reach out uh, if some of this thinking resonates with them and we can do things together. There's always ways to collaborate. Fascinating, fascinating. If you allow me, usually I would say thank you now, but I have one more question um, and that's um, maybe, uh, uh, that's a perfect question um, at the end of this show. You got to visit the Playboy Mansion in Los Angeles during <laughs> during a gala um, for for Arthur C. Clarke. How was that? Oh, yes, of course. That's a, that's a very naughty question. But anyway, uh, we were not allowed into the Playboy Mansion, unfortunately. We celebrated the year 2001 <laughs> and Arthur C. Clarke and Kubrick in the Playboy Mansion grounds. There's a grotto and the grounds around the Playboy Mansion, which is where the big party was. And some of the Hollywood stars like Tom Hanks, uh, Cameron, Morgan Freeman, those who have a love of space, they showed up as well. Uh, Patrick Stewart. Yes, Patrick, Patrick indeed. In fact, my company, Moonfront, we made a film for the gala, for the big party, which was the voiceover was by Patrick Stewart. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> I remember a conversation with Morgan Freeman there. He said that he had optioned the Rama Chronicles from Arthur Clarke, uh, uh, who happened to be one of my mentors. And he said David Fincher was writing the script and rewriting the script because at the end of the day, a Hollywood film needs to have enough blood and gore. So making, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that was a great uh, takeaway from our little party that we had there. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, close it, if you don't mind, with an anecdote. Um, those of you who've seen the movie Martian by Ridley Scott, you know why I loved that film, Marcus? was Ridley Scott, he studied at the RCA, and he's a designer and a film director. And if you look at the plot in that film, unlike your mainstream Hollywood space film, when the American astronaut is stranded and he needs to be rescued and brought back to Earth, mm -hmm. it's the Chinese space station which comes to the rescue. So it's part of the rescue plot. And I love that because here nice. is a British director saying, let's not do international cooperation just for strategic reasons, but for reasons of the heart and rescue our comrades in space if we need to. Great. Uh, that's a, such a beautiful story to, to end this. Um, thank you so much to Smita Mohanty for taking the time. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for flying with us today. What a refreshing and heartwarming ride that was. By the way, are you familiar with the completely new and incredibly fascinating series on Space Watch Global called Space Cafe Radio? Be sure to check it out as soon as you can. And by the way, always consider becoming a Space Watcher, will you? Well, goodbye for now. Until next time. <laughs>